In this video, we're going to talk about the differences between CW and FTIR. CW stands for continuous wave and FT stands for Fourier transform. Now in order to understand the differences between those two, let's look at the schematic diagrams of the instruments and we'll look at how they work. So first, in continuous wave or CWIR, what we are doing is we are continuously varying the wavelength of infrared radiation that we are using to sample the material that we're trying to analyze. Now in order to do that, basically what we do is we start with an IR source. Now the IR source is basically our source of infrared radiation, which you can think of as a glowing wire. If you've ever seen, for instance, a cast iron skillet sitting on a stove and you, you crank up the heat and you see it begin to glow, that's IR radiation. So we take our source of IR radiation and the first thing we do is we split the beam into two. Now why do we do this? Well, first of all, half of our beam is going to bounce off a mirror and pass through what we call a reference sample. This is because when we collect an IR spectrum of a sample, if we have gases in the room, for instance, that can interfere with our IR spectrum and trick us into thinking that the uh, gases are part of the structure of the molecule we're trying to analyze, well, we want to avoid that. So we pass half of our IR light beam through a reference sample, which is basically just an empty chamber that will contain gases that are present in the room. The other half of the IR beam we take and we pass it through our sample chamber and this contains the material we're trying to analyze. So now if we take those two beams and we recombine them then what's going to happen is if we recombine them then we will be subtracting out any gases like for instance carbon dioxide any gases that might be in the room that could interfere with our sample we subtract them out. Then we take that combined IR signal and we pass it through what's known as a diffraction grating. In a CWIR instrument, the diffraction grating is, is basically a series of filters. And what this is going to allow us to do is it's going to allow us to sample one wavelength at a time. And so we are going to continuously vary the wavelengths we are analyzing with that's where the name CW comes from. And we continuously vary. We look at one wavelength and see if it interacts with our sample. Then we go to the next one, see if it interacts with our sample. And then we just continuously vary the wavelength, looking for those wavelengths that are going to interact with our sample. Whenever there is a wavelength that resonates with our sample or interacts with our sample, then on a scrolling piece of chart paper, a pen will make a mark that will show you, aha, here at this frequency, the molecule is interacting with the infrared radiation. So all of that uh, information goes to a detector, is amplified, printed out on a piece of chart paper, and that's how you collect IR spectra on a CWIR. Now, the way we actually do IR uh, sampling these days is with FTIR. The FT stands for Fourier transform. So in order to understand how this works, we need to understand what a Michelson interferometer is. So let me just summarize this for you. So with the Michelson interferometer, what we're doing here is basically we're starting out the same way. So if you look here, we have our source of IR radiation, and then we take the IR light and we pass it through a mirror. Now I say through a mirror because this mirror here that you see at 45 degrees is actually a half silvered mirror. That means that half of the light passes through the mirror and half of the light actually reflects off of the mirror. Now since the mirror is at a 45 degree angle, this means that the light that reflects off the mirror is going to reflect at a 90 degree angle. You may have seen half-silvered mirrors on television shows or in movies. It's, it's what they use in interrogation rooms uh, where uh, the person being interrogated in the room cannot see people standing behind the glass, but in the room it looks like they're looking in a mirror. That's a half-silvered mirror. So again, half the light passes through the mirror, half the light reflects off the mirror, 
at a 90 degree angle. Now here's the interesting part, and this is why we call this a Michelson interferometer. The light that is reflecting off the mirror at 90 degrees here hits this second mirror, but this second mirror is not a stationary mirror. It is a moving mirror, and when I say moving, I mean it's actually vibrating very, very fast. And why does that change things? Well, because if light comes along and hits this mirror that's vibrating very, very fast, and then the light reflects back to where it came from, what happens is this. As the light goes back to the half-silvered mirror, again, half the light will pass through the mirror, and the light that's coming back from the fixed mirror, half of it will pass through the mirror, but half of it will also reflect and so when it reflects at 90 degrees what this basically means is that these two beams that were split and then one of them hit the vibrating mirror those two beams come back together and recombine and it is the recombined IR signal that then moves off to where your sample is so what we are doing here is we are generating an interferogram and this Michelson interferometer if the name Michelson sounds familiar to you Perhaps it should, because in any general physics textbook, the name Michelson comes up. This is the same Michelson of the very famous Michelson and Morley experiment, where Michelson and Morley were two scientists who, for the very first time, came up with a really accurate measurement of the speed of light using this type of setup. So this recombined signal, this interferogram, we call it, what does it look like, and how does it work for us? Okay, well, if we look here, we can see two sine curves being superimposed on top of each other. Now notice, they are the same wavelength, and they're in phase with each other, which means when they combine, if you look at the signal on the bottom, then they are combining in a 100% constructive fashion, and so we basically double the amplitude. However, if I change one of the wavelengths, I can change it to a different wavelength, or I can make them out of phase with each other. Then when they recombine, again, look at the bottom, and now they are interfering with each other, sometimes constructively, sometimes destructively. This is what is the beginning of the interferogram that we use in the IR spectrometer. But we don't just have two wavelengths of IR light. We have many, many, many wavelengths of IR light that are superimposing on top of each other. And so this is what the... Uh, interferogram would actually look like for your IR spectrometer. And so with that interferogram, let's just simplify this and look at this and say, okay, so if one of these on the screen is the interferogram generated by the Michelson interferometer, and what the other one is showing you is when you have the interferogram interact with a the sample, then if there are things in the sample that are going to absorb any of the light in the interferogram, it will actually change the interferogram. It will change what it looks like. And so one of these is actually showing the interferogram when it's interacting with the sample. So we take all of this raw data, and what we do is we need to analyze it. Now the data is collected uh, by measuring in time. And so our x-axis in collecting the data is uh, time in seconds for IR spectroscopy. And so we have very short bursts of light with all of this jumbled information in it. We have to take it and we want to transform the information in from a time axis to a frequency axis so we can measure the frequency or the energies where the infrared radiation is being absorbed. And so that's where the Fourier transform comes in. If we perform a Fourier transform on our raw data, then the Fourier transform converts our time domain to a frequency domain. And when we do that, an infrared spectrum will have an x-axis where we are measuring frequencies or energies. And in the next video, we're going to talk about these peaks that we see in the IR spectrum. What are they? What do they mean? And when we learn how to interpret them, how is that going to help us understand the structure of a molecule?